Globus. Thank you, and welcome everybody to what promises to be a really wonderful discussion this morning, where we'll be looking at the digital transformation and how across the world, from the Middle East, um, the US, Japan, India, this transformation is impacting on how we do business, on how we consume, on how we learn, and indeed, how we understand the world around us and our own place within it. It's a transformation that's really been epochal and perhaps unsurprisingly, it's brought a number of challenges as well as opportunities in its wake. As a journalist myself and with two representatives here from the media, I think it's natural to explore questions this morning about the impact of the digital transformation on the news and media industries. There are challenges of distribution, since increasingly consumers access their information, their worldview, through social media platforms rather than a legacy media. Um, these have led to huge challenges um, to the newspaper industry in particular, which is at somewhat of an inflection point as it feels the pressure to transform itself and yet has not really developed the kind of viable financial models that would perhaps enable it to do so. The fact is that consumers all around the world have become used to and have a certain expectation of free information these days. Um, and that makes it very challenging in particular for legacy media that were based on very different set of assumptions. And then of course you have the social challenge that all of this creates where you have the impact on society when it becomes very easy for people to avoid certain kinds of news and information and end up living in silos of information which only amplify their pre-existing biases and their pre-existing prejudices. Or we have a world filled with fake news, with propaganda. It's increasingly difficult to distinguish right from wrong, truth from falsehood. Anybody with a mobile phone in their hand today in some ways has as much weight as the New York Times, depending on who the consumer of that information is out there. Which leads us, of course, to the policy challenges uh, which governments across um, the, the world face of how best or whether at all to regulate all of this. Um, so these are some of the sort of very meaty um, and uh, really important, significant issues that we will be tackling with our wonderful panel here today. I'm going to kick off with a question for Faisal um, over there on the extreme left of me. Uh, Faisal is editor-in-chief of Arab News, and I know that um, you launched, you relaunched recently with a kind of digital-first uh, uh, policy. Can you explain a little bit about why you felt this was necessary and what it means exactly when you say digital first? Uh, so uh, basically we, we can't go back in time and we can't go uh, against uh, the tide and uh, we can either uh, curse the darkness or decide to uh, light a candle. Um, um, which in technical terms means you know we need to get on board because if uh, traditional publishers, uh, when, I, when I say traditional publishers, I mean uh, pr press houses, broadcasters who have a board of trustees or has, who have a code of conduct, don't engage with, as you described, everybody who has a mobile phone. You're only leaving uh, the platform for people who, are, who have agendas or, or people who are doing this uh, for fun. Um, so uh, we take on uh, the challenge. Uh, we're lucky enough uh, to be from a part of the, uh, the world and being a niche uh, newspaper. Uh, so we can use a lot of the income that we get for the print edition to uh, finance our digital uh, expansion. But it's a big challenge. And uh, before we get, I know we're in the discussion, we're gonna get to the ethical and, and social aspects of it. But there is the business challenge of it, which is uh, when you are print uh, only or where you are in news business, you're competing in our case against our local newspaper uh, competitors. Uh, internationally, uh, you're competing against the New York Times, the Washington Post for that slice of attention for the consumer. Um, 
So it used to be apples to apples. Today, uh, we are no longer competing apples to apples. We're competing apples to strawberries, apples to pears, apples to pineapples. Um, <laughs> basically, yeah, because you're on your phone. Yes. <laughs> Good one. So I'll use that uh, for, for, but I will quote you because we're a credible media, so I will source you. So, um, uh, so technically on people's phones, you're competing against Netflix, you're competing against Facebook, uh, Facebook uh, and YouTube, and not just on time, um, but these people are able to sell the same target market, which we are, in our case, people who are interested in the Middle East. We have about 6 million unique visitors a month. For it to make sense for us, um, we need to charge a premium for the click uh, because for me to publish a story, it ne I have to hire a professional journalist, a professional photographer. We have some of them here with us, uh, copy editor, proofreader, fact checker, legal advisor. All of that uh, requires uh, uh, a cost. So for me, for example, I have to s uh, charge uh, 50 cents per click. Uh, the problem w with competing with the big five, with uh, f Facebook, Google, uh, Twitter, etc., is for them, they can charge two cents as opposed to 50 cents. The advertiser will always go for what makes economical uh, value for them. I don't want to take much of the time, but that is not just the last thing I want to say. This is not the challenge just for Arab news, but similarly with the New York Times, um, with The Guardian, uh, with probably the Asahi uh, Shimbun here, we're all in this uh, together. And uh, I hope throughout the discussion, we can discuss a bit the social aspects of this challenge. Yeah, so I think you kind of got to one of the core points of um, the issue we're talking about today, which is this whole comparing apples to pineapples. I love that phrase. I'm going to borrow it. But I guess um, if you would say legacy media are apples, in many ways, the social media platforms are the pineapples. Uh, so what you're looking at is a newspaper which has uh, journalists and editors and fact checkers and photographers versus a social media platform, which is essentially aggregating from all over, but is becoming the main form of distribution and consumption of news, which makes it very complicated. Um, it may, perhaps you could step in here, Sasaki-san, because you have your own uh, business model, which is uh, a little bit different from either. It's a kind yes. of curation service. Mm -hmm. um, if you could talk a little bit about news specs and about uh, whether you think that this is really the future, where newspapers in some way collaborate and gather under one exactly. uh, platform so that the consumer mm -hmm. has one kind of gateway to this mm -hmm. wide variety of uh, services. Okay, thank you. Thank you for my introduction. Uh, Newspeaks is a, a business news curation service which is launched five years ago. And at first, we are just curating news all over the world. But uh, after I joined the Newspeaks as a chief editor, we created the editorial team to create original content. Original content. So in that sense, Newspeaks are uh, a, a little bit similar to business news version of Netflix. I mean that Newspeak, uh, Netflix is also curating a uh, lot of movie or something from, let's say, Disney or Fox. And also Netflix in, is investing in a lot of money yeah. Yeah, to, create, to, to create original content. So it's a similar model. And I think this, we can say this, publisher, publisher plus platform. Platform plus publisher. We call this is publisher. Publisher, <laughs> <laughs> publisher model. It's the best business model, I think, in this age. In this place. And this is working quite well now. We, we, are, we have more than four, four, 4 million registered users, and more than 100,000 paid subscribers, and also we have uh, revenues from ad revenues. So I think this mix is the uh, best model, I think, now. So do you think that consumers want that kind of curation rather than just going to their Facebook pages or Twitter and seeing what's on a, or, you know, the algorithms are already pre-preparing for them? Why would they pick something like your service over what's already available to them on their social media? What do you offer yeah. that's more? More, uh, yes. Maybe we are competing with Facebook and on Twitter, but we are, we are not, uh, we are not, we, uh, because people choose Newspeak because we curated news by from uh, from reliable news sources, and not only algorithm but also people, professional curators choose news. 
that's a big difference from maybe Facebook or Twitter. So maybe I would like to hear your opinion about Facebook. Because he so he this is a work, little secret. We know John Facebook. here <laughs> as uh, he Mercari, yeah, but he's actually ex-Facebook. So he has a lot to answer for on this panel. There'll be a spotlight on him. But yeah, do jump in, John. Sure. No, I, I think the way it started in Silicon Valley is that we thought, well, you know, people are biased. How about we use an algorithm that just basically looks at the outcomes of how people respond to the content, whether they engage, whether they comment. Well, if they engage and comment, probably it's good. You know, it means that people find value in it. And that was the genesis, I think, of how all of this kind of askew uh, presentation of, of news happened. Well, funnily enough, I think the traditional media then, in their you know, um, desperation to also get clicks and get more eyeballs and more, more time spent, uh, started going for the endorphin kicking headlines and news as well. And they also have that in the past. So I don't think it's clean cut between these platforms and traditional media. It's really about eyeballs, but yes, um, it's, um, it's hard to claim that algorithms alone uh, you know, are, are cleaner than when humans are, are involved because obviously there are unintended consequences. And I'll just wrap up by saying that I don't think um, that uh, the Silicon Valley companies as a whole, you can look at YouTube, you can look at Facebook, caught, early, ca caught on early enough uh, what these algorithms are doing in terms of how things are getting polarized. So Faisal, coming back to you. So that's right. You know, the first um, round that we had, we looked a little bit about more of the negative consequences. And when you look at legacy media, there are negative consequences, obviously, because they have to change, transform, and they're struggling to do so. But there have also been a lot of positive consequences of this digital transformation. There is greater democratization. There is the ability to have greater fact checking. There's greater there's greater fake news out there today, perhaps. Uh, but there was always uh, misinformation. There was always disinformation and the individual consumer had no way of actually checking up for themselves earlier. Often, I mean, I worked as a journalist in the pre-Google days in 1998, 1999, and I remember going out to do stories, and before I could do a story, I had to go to the library and look at clippings, and, you know, by the time I was even able to get access to it, it was time for me to go and do the interview. I had very little opportunity to do in-depth background research and actually be able to, therefore, ask tough questions of whoever I was talking to because I did not have access to that information. So I think the digital transformation has also been very enabling. It's also been democratizing. And in many ways, it can make all of us much more critical human beings rather than passive receptors. So could you talk a little bit about that, like the, the both sides to the equation? Um, so funny enough, in 2011, uh, I was halfway writing a book on social media. This was following the Arab Spring. And as you remember, um, some people even called it the Twitter revolution or the hashtag revolution. And um, like many people, uh, I was deceived uh, to think that social media uh, is the best thing to happen to humanity since uh, sliced bread. Uh, um, well, that's because, you know, uh, it was there was sort of a, a romanticism that's kind of swept the region when we saw people, uh, leaders, uh, dictators who were there for 30 years being removed by the power of, of uh, people getting together on, on social media. And then uh, the Egyptian model was great because they, after they, uh, you know, occupied Tahrir Square, they tweeted saying, okay, now let's clean it up. That was great. But then the ugly side of, of social media uh, came out. And, uh, you know, we need to understand there's not been a single moment in human, human history where this uh, many people had the power to send and receive information without filters. Now, this is great powers, and uh, to quote uh, everybody's favorite superhero, Spider-Man, <laughs> with great powers comes great responsibility. The problem is we're having the powers, but we are not appreciating the responsibility uh, that comes uh, with it. Um, to quote a more serious person on the internet, I quote Eric Schmidt, uh, the former CEO of uh, Google, who described the internet uh, uh, as the first invention that humanity created that humanity doesn't really understand. Quote, it's the biggest experiment in anarchy that we ever lived in. And this is true because, you know, we know how it started, we don't know how it ends. You know, this is not like the invention, for example, of the Betamax or, um, you know, a video game console where you know what goes in and what's the likely outcomes. We are still seeing applications being uh, developed. I agree with you. 
a lot of it was positive. <laughs> but if you look at the uh, terrorist recruitment videos that are being shared on YouTube, that are being shared on, on social media, and um, you, uh, social media platforms for a very long time, because they were getting probably the clicks uh, and because they didn't want to have any responsibility, they were saying, we're just a platform. The user, the end user is the person responsible. And if you consume it, that's your choice. Now we're seeing them becoming much more like traditional publishers because a lot of governments and a lot of NGOs are putting pressure on them and saying, well, hold on. If you're a publisher, if you're a carrier, then you are also uh, uh, liable. And, uh, you know, um, uh, not with you, but I had a different um, uh, executive from Facebook once in a media forum. And to that argument, I said, well, just there's sort of um, a duplicity in this case because on many of the social media platforms, if you see a clip of pornography or a copyrighted material, then it's immediately removed. How come we're having an argument on whether or not somebody slaughtering somebody and blood spilling down um, is something that's freedom of expression? It's not. And you know, it might be the virtual world, but it has real consequences because it's our children, it's our new generation that is being brainwashed and recruited by um, such uh, platforms. John, I see you want to jump in there. Yeah, it's just interesting because I, I agree. I think there's a level of hypocrisy uh, in each culture, actually, where you have things that are just acceptable and others are not. In Europe, you can have much more nudity in media. No one really cares. In America, if you know, have even something that is, resembles nudity, that's a huge deal. But violence, go all in, all day long, no <laughs> problems, you know, whatever it might be. And that's, that's just uh, completely, obviously, biased. And these are now global media, platf media platforms, global platforms, but there are American values applied, as a Swede, I can say this, there are American values applied to this uh, under the disguise of freedom of speech, absolutely. And uh, so I, I agree with you there. And, uh, and obviously it's also a business. So finding the right balance there, really hard. I don't think regulators are the ones that will make it right though, because they, they don't have the level of depth of understanding of the technology or the speed to actually keep up with what's going on there. So. So I think that's a good point, uh, place to kind of talk a little bit more about regulation. And if regulators are not the ones who are going to make the difference, who is going to make the difference? I mean, ultimately, um, digital platforms, they put pressure on existing government policies because they have to walk a kind of fine balance between stimulating innovation and economic development on the one hand and safeguarding so-called public interest on the other hand. Um, so how can we hold, uh, for example, social media platforms uh, accountable if it is not uh, through uh, the sort of regulatory policy? What other uh, options uh, are available to us as societies if it is not through regulation, despite the fact that, of course, regulation presents its own challenges, like are the regulators regulating themselves? I mean, often you have countries where the purveyors of fake media are the governments themselves, and then the governments are kind of deciding what is fake news and what is fake news. So you've got all of these kind of complications, obviously. But but what are the options that we have, if not uh, traditional policy regulation? Um, so as a journalist, again, uh, I cringe when I hear the word regulation or government censorship or uh, any sort of that. But the reality is um, this cannot go on because we are seeing, um, in a less bloody terms, we are seeing outcomes. So, you know, I respect the British people's right to vote, to leave the EU or stay in the EU. That's their call. But what I don't respect is a campaign built on lies and spread on social media. And, you know, the famous saying, if you repeat a lie long enough uh, or if it's big enough, people will, people will believe it. This is what's happening. You know, politicians are not being held accountable. So suddenly, if you are a president of a great country, or a big country or, a, you know, a prime minister. Um, you can say whatever you want and uh, there's enough accounts retweeting you and reposting the account so that people believe the narrative. And if you come and do a fact check, it has nothing to do with the truth. So there is a social impact of it. I don't think, you know, uh, the, 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 the solution is a draconian measurement where you kind of go close down. But what we need to do is we need to level the playing field, as I said, and I take everybody's point. Traditional media is not without its fault, but at least you know who you're dealing with. In our case, there's a holding company that you know that has a legal department that you can contact if there's an issue. The problem with w the current uh, format is, you know, as I said earlier, we need to hire copy editors, uh, you know, journalists, professional writers, etc. All it takes to create 
a fake news story is a $12 domain name, realnews.jp, for example. <laughs> You know, somebody with a wild imagination to write a sensational headline, and Google is going to reward you because you're going to get the clicks and you get free money for for essentially your 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 imagination. So um, what we need to do is uh, there is an interesting experiment in the EU. I'm not familiar. I'm not sure whether it has had materialized or not. But there was a white paper that suggests taxing um, the big technology companies. Uh, so, whereby some of the uh, some of the revenue goes to support, you know, traditional media outlets that you have. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the best. Because model. we all know that public service TV is completely unbiased. So, uh, you know, I'm a you know I'm or, or I'm biased in that sense. I really like the BBC, but uh, I used to like the BBC. Lately, I'm not so sure. So, but you know, again, there is. Uh, let's just see. There is, uh, you know, it's a myth that there is complete unbiased. Let's just say. Uh, let's just say, say that for sure. Sure, but you have to choose something, you know, choose your poison uh, as it is, you know. I would much rather uh, choose uh, somebody that I know and I can deal with uh, uh, as opposed to ghosts that are available online and I don't know where the traffic or the story is coming from. So it's a kind of known devil versus the unknown devil. Um, how about you, John? What do you think about this proposal of use of taxing the big players to somehow give that to legacy media itself? So, to me, it seems a bit wrong-headed. A lot of the legacy media actually are quite wealthy in yeah, their own I, capacity. I grew up in a pretty socialist culture of, of Sweden during the Soviet era, and there was a lot of kind of communist-type politicians, so, so it was a lot about... Every, everything should be equal. I do believe in, in um, competition and how that drives people to really try to do better and be better. But I think um, the big issue that we have is the business model where now it's about eyeballs and you know basically it's the war of the endorphins where whoever tells, as you said, either the biggest lie or the thing that can trigger someone the most to take an action or tap or make comments because it gets them excited. It's the same like with fast food, the maximum amount of salt and sugar, the maximum amount of sensationalism in the headlines. Traditional media has been playing that game as well. It's just that we got even better at it with the new technology. That probably needs to change. So if that means a Netflix model where it's like more subscription based, if people are willing to pay for not being hacked, you know, not having their brains hijacked by whatever, you know, will pull them in to spend the most time so they can be sold ads against using their personal information to, then that's probably good. So I think it's a business model issue where, again, I'll wrap up by saying uh, we have to have a way to teach our kids to build up the muscle to realize that it's not probably healthy to be controlled by, uh, you know, uh, the, the endorphin triggering extremes of what is being now presented, whether it's through a tweet or whatever it might be. It's, it's that kind of noise level that captures people. Uh, it's probably, you know, unhealthy, and I think it's going to take generations um, to, uh, to get that into a place where, just as we have learned pretty early on how to read and look for bias in traditional media, I think we need to build that muscle for our kids and oncoming uh, on, uh, you know, generations. I mean, it's the fact is that we're tom tomming uh, traditional media over here, but uh, there is a huge crisis of trust in the traditional media around the world. And if you look at um, a lot of surveys that have been done, even in India, for example, the media is one of the least trusted uh, institutions out there, kind of up there with politicians. It's not that anybody believes that media are these heroic, uh, you know, fact finders who are going out there and investigating the truth. They have a very cozy relationship with government. They have a very cozy relationship relationship with business and in many ways it's like they haven't really been going out and doing their work and proving that they are worth uh, uh, they actually have value and that people should be paying for them so it's all very well to say oh the New York Times is in decline there are a lot of people who believe the New York Times is fake news you know so I mean our whole definition of what is fake news kind of gets turned on its head perhaps you could talk a little bit about this Sasaki san unfortunately in Japan we do have a free media but we also have a situation where a lot of journalists are very uncomfortably close to people in power. And there has been this tradition of sources and journalists being very, very close over here. So how does one kind of address that? And how does the digital transformation play into that? Is that uh, does that help? Is it empowering? Is it, does it make it disempowering in any way? Okay. First of all, uh, the problem with uh, fake news in Japan is not as severe as uh, outside of Japan. But maybe in the future, maybe in the next decade, Japan will also face the similar problem the Western world is seeing. For example, in Japan, Twitter is very popular. But most Japanese people tweet anonymously. 
anonymously based on unsupported facts. This is a big problem. And also, as you, as you said, in Japan still, traditional established media are very, very strong. strong. But uh, they depend their sources, maybe mostly on governments or officials, so their information is not diversified. So I think the most important thing is that Japan's journalists should be more independent. I mean that free from not only power, but also company by itself. Japanese, Japanese journalists tend to continue to work only one company, Yomiuri or Asahi or uh, Nikkei. This, this is not a good thing. They should be, first of all, should be independent and to write a report or an uh, investigative report or something. Not for company, not for boss, but for society. <laughs> That's the most important thing, I think. So the <laughs> fact that today you can be an independent journalist more easily, you have uh, access to be able to distribute, for example, much more easily. You don't have to belong to Yomuri, you can have your own blog. You don't have to belong to Asahi, you can use Twitter, you know, whatever, to kind of yeah, get yeah. your stories out. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing that impact at all on journalism in Japan? Has it actually made a difference and diversified the voices and led to more creative or independent journalism or not? Uh, yes, it's okay to work for some companies, yeah. but I, I think that the problem is to continue to work only one company for their lifetimes. So uh, we need to maybe, uh, related to the, maybe the government support, I think the most important question is how to sustain high quality public interest journalism. So for that purpose, maybe we, government intervention is maybe necessary. Let's say government, uh, I, how can I say it? But maybe, let's say, I would like to introduce this report, this report, the Khan Cross Report, yeah. which is released in Britain this February. And this economist uh, uh, was asked by the British government to research on how to sustain high quality journalism. And she made uh, a lot of good recommendations. And one of them is direct funding by public institution funded by government and also as a financial sources. And also, let's say, the investigation by the competition regulator into the online advertising marketplace, where the Google and the Facebook, and in Japan's case, Yahoo Japan, is very too dominant. So in some, in, in some way, we need to do some intervention without sacrificing uh, freedom of speech. But isn't that last part just jealousy? Jealousy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an interesting point that you make about the different kind of financial models that we mm. can have for independent journalism. And we're seeing, for example, uh, direct uh, uh, funding, of course, from institutions, but also from individuals. And you have journalists that just yeah. uh, seek uh, support for their stories. If you like the stories I do, you know, pay exactly. $5 into my whatever account. And uh, mm. there are people who've been able to uh, make some kind of success of that model. There are also journalistic cooperatives where there's a lot of freelance journalists who kind of come together, club resources, and whatever money they make from their stories, they actually again pool that money uh, specifically for investigative stories or whatever their field might be. So I think obviously the need for the hour to meet the digital transformation is to use the toolbox that the digital transformation uh, allows all of us um, uh, to kind of uh, move, move, move forward rather than try to necessarily get rid of that digital transformation. I don't think that that's going to be happening happening anytime yeah. soon. Um, John, would you like to jump in here with any uh, further comments or thoughts on the discussion so far? No, it's, it's, I, I just think it's, it's very easy to just want to bash the winners right now because of the problems that they're also bringing with them with the other uh, positive things that I think the technology has brought. But, uh, um, you know, uh, I, I don't think that, uh, again, regulation or breaking up these companies or, you know, investigating them for anti-competitive behavior. Uh, <laughs> Many of these top top media houses uh, in traditional media were very dominant with you know having all the eyeballs and uh, reaping the benefits of that as well. So, it, I, I'd rather focus on you know um, uh, other parts of of how we can use the technology with uh, other funding. I think that's more interesting. Um, uh, perhaps, John, you could also talk a little bit about online marketplaces. I know we've been talking more specifically about the news uh, media industry, but uh, do you see any parallels in some of the challenges um, that well, are facing the two? Well, I, I think the parallel is that um, 
uh, I often, when I talk about Mercari, which is the company I, I work with, which is a marketplace for just regular people to buy and sell things with each other, um, the beauty of it is that it means that not everything has to filter through corporate America or corporate, you know, wherever. Uh, you can do things directly with each other. And there is a, there's a warmth that comes with when you're actually buying and selling something with just a regular other person. Uh, without you know that uh, everything going the Amazon or Walmart or something like that, and I think for media too, the uh, the empowerment that comes of the ability to be able to write your story and have it shared with everyone, even though you might not be a journalist on a Nikkei or Asahi or you know New York Times platform, I, I think that that is empowering, and I think that is quite fantastic. Now. It, it means that you're going to have uh, an enormous amount of noise out there. And you know, to your curation point, signal-to-noise ratio is very challenging. And it's the same with marketplaces. You, you, uh, I rely on our users actually shipping things on time. And when things don't ship on time, they, be, they become angry with Mercari, uh, not with the person that didn't ship on time. Um, so it's easy to get angry with the platform. But I think it's actually really uh, try to create good incentives so that you can evaluate whether the person you're buying from or selling to has some reasonable track record of being a responsible person, you know, le legit. Well, maybe that's what's needed in the, in the media side as well. Uh, so at least, you know, uh, we have some level of, even if your real name is not shown uh, on the platform, at least on the back end, we have some real name information so that we can track the individuals. We KYC most of our users. Okay, so maybe we stay anonymous, but they're KYC'd on the back end. And, uh, and then if someone is, keeps spreading misinformation, we shouldn't shut down their account, but at least we can kind of flag that, yeah, this person tends to write, you know, put out sensational stuff that 10 other users said was not true. Now, I don't necessarily want to go to the social media score of China. You know, I think that's scary. And for those of you who've seen that Black Mirror episode, you know, because we keep marketing Netflix today, uh, that's uh, where you know, everybody has a score over their head and you can kind of always optimize your life to improve that score. That's obviously scary as well. But I do think there's some beauty to uh, people connecting with people without having corporate interests uh, in the middle. Uh, and that's the beauty of platforms in my, in my view. Just a quick aside, because you brought up the social media um, score keeping in China, and I know that this has a hugely sort of negative response around the world, and people sort of see it as a black mirror kind of episode of, oh my God. But uh, interestingly, whenever I've spoken to Chinese people about it, they're actually, they see it in a very benign way. I, I take pride in my Uber score. I yeah. have, have 4.88. <laughs> you know, I tell people, you know, I'm always friendly with the drivers. And, yeah, right, right. Yeah. You want you want to get your driver to come on time. But I think for a lot of them, they also see it as a way of accountability and getting out of scams. Because when you don't, when you have this kind of digital environment and you don't know who you're dealing with, who's selling you something, it, who's giving you a service. It used to when you have we look at each other. You know, that's we right. use heuristics, which is, you know, obviously heavily debated now because that's not really kind to only look at someone. Yeah, those glasses and the way you dress. I, it, we haven't met, but it looks like I can trust you. And when you're online, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, and, and and likewise, and we had a we we had a no type policy by Hori San, but uh, but John, you know, what about me? You've left me out of this trusting. You're the moderator, of course, of course. No, but all joking aside, it, it, humans have always used heuristics to evaluate, uh, you know, the uh, ability to trust in otherwise risky transactions. And as everything turns digital, our usual heuristics have disappeared. And it used to be that we could use brands, you know, like New York Times or whatnot, um, as also a heuristics tool. And I think we just need to figure that out how, as that gets fragmented into people down to the individual level, how can we still uh, do that in the digital world? Correct. So, for example, if I'm a purveyor of fake news, I might get a social media score of zero. And then that's one way of weeding it out, right? Could work. Yeah, okay, so let's get back to uh, Faisal. Um, so, you know, we're looking at digital transformation, and when it comes to the newspaper industry, it is obviously not just a question of transferring everything that you were doing in the newspaper onto an online format. Like, going digital means something much deeper than just switching um, the medium. I think fundamentally we have to relook at the role of journalists and editors and what we do. Um, what do you see, uh, how do you see the role of the journalist and the editor as having changed in the last 10 years? What do they have to be doing that's different than they were doing 10 years ago? Uh, so essentially, uh, we're now all uh, news agencies. We're all 24 hour seven news agencies. That's the fundamental uh, difference. So you no longer have one edition. Uh, so 
you know, my predecessors probably in the 80s left the office at 7 o'clock. The, you know, 8 o'clock they see the front page. It goes to print. They have a good night's sleep. And then whatever comes after it, you've missed the print deadline. Um, broadcasters before 24, before CNN created the 24-hour news concept, um, um, you know, had one main news bulletin a day. Uh, and then uh, you had the whole day to prepare the news. Um, with uh, specifically not with the internet, but with broadband, uh, you now have the ability for having um, kind of instant uh, feeds, instant news. Uh, and of course, the pressure here is if you speak, for example, to Reuters or AFP, they will tell you that their struggle or the BBC, which you don't really like, but anymore. <laughs> but, anymore. but the the biggest struggle is always in the newsroom between time uh, and getting it uh, right. And, uh, you know, it used to be bad when there was one edition or one news bulletin. Imagine the pressure that you're under now because everybody is tweeting it and everybody is doing it. And then you're kind of crushed between uh, saying people telling you you are too slow or you are too afraid to publish uh, or you, somebody out scooped you. Um, so... Uh, Again, just to kind of bring it back to, uh, I don't want to be the person who's all talking doom and gloom, but if artificial intelligence created this problem, then I believe artificial intelligence can also solve this problem. Because, um, you know, what we need to do is get uh, softwares, uh, is get applications where um, a robot uh, can detect whether a picture has been altered or a video that, and you know, by the way, if you haven't seen uh, what's called deep fake, it's really scary. Like somebody can record me for five minutes and then they can make me, they capture my voice, they capture my face movement and they can make me say things I never said. And they will spread it and again, because of the people tweeting it, people will believe. So it is impossible for the human eye, no matter how, unless you were there in the room and you take, take an oath and say, I didn't hear him say this, um, it's impossible to be able to do it. So the only solution to that uh, pressure is through artificial uh, intelligence as well. Um, similarly with targeting news, similarly with, uh, well, targeting and distribution, uh, and similarly with also finding uh, sources. So there is, uh, there is a gleam of hope in, in, uh, in technology. It has the ability to make our uh, jobs easier, but we really need to get together uh, to uh, find a business model that works for traditional publishers to do their job. So with artificial intelligence, we have the ability to make it easier for us to do our job. We also have the danger of being replaced altogether and not having any jobs anymore. I don't know if you've seen the, the, the robot news presenters that uh, China has unveiled, where you've actually got a robot that comes and you know tells you the whole new, uh, news bulletin. And it's very realistic, uh, uh, increasingly. But you know, just to take, um, to play devil's advocate, with what you were saying about how the big change has been that you have to go faster and faster and faster in terms of the news cycle and you have to respond minute by minute. Uh, don't you think that one way of looking at it would be that um, traditional media might need to actually go slower than they were going before and rather than trying to compete on these uh, on, on, on the speed because you know, you're never going to have journalists out every single place. You're always going to have somebody with a mobile phone on the scene so that the role of the journalist is not to be there on the scene taking the pictures of a fire because you know it's almost impossible for them to do that uh, but to actually take time to find out what happened to more reflection more opinion slow detail rather than this kind of let's just respond to what's going on what's going on yeah John. as you think of your response I'll tag on one more thing which is uh, one really interesting trend is the growth of a uh, podcast media and people's willingness, and also on YouTube, to look at people debating, maybe you're getting tired of this one hour session, but there are really good uh, you know, podcasts out there where people will have a very deep conversation for two, th two, three hours about really hard topics, and they're getting millions and millions of people watching. And I think there's that, the, the, the condensed kind of endorphin triggering, kind of uh, bite-sized, people are, are really getting uh, uh, over it and they're, they're thirsting for long form media, which you guys should be perfectly positioned to, to reap the benefits of. Perhaps we could have Sasaki-san come in before we go back to you. Yeah. About? 
yeah, about, uh, sorry, okay. about, uh, about <laughs> sorry. long form media uh, and short form media, media and yes, whether what we're seeing is the kind uh, of changing okay. role of the journalist uh, and whether. And, oh, and, okay, yeah. okay, sorry. I, I, I would say that the most journalists maybe should, would, would, be, would be replaced by artificial intelligence in the near future. But, uh, but I would like to, uh, I would like to uh, say that the and high quality journalism let's say, to collect the information, first-hand information, first-hand information on the ground. It's necessary, maybe, maybe human people should do, professional journalists should collect such kind of information. So uh, my conclusion is most journalists would be depressed, but very talented, very talented, and the public interest. The three of us, right? <laughs> yeah, we're safe, yeah. we're safe. Yeah. 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 Public interest. Public interest-oriented professional journalists is very, very necessary for the society. That's why you're looking so relaxed. <laughs> Faisal, back to you. So I don't want to sound overconfident, but I don't think even a robot would accept to be an editor in the Middle East. So, so you'll see how gray, how quickly their hair will turn gray, and how much wrinkles. He's actually 19 years old. Yeah. Like, yeah. So um, I um, look. I, I um, I've had discussions about this with with the people who developed the technology, and I think the model is um, yes, absolutely. So it essentially what artificial intelligence could do is free up our time. So you know, to take a, a, a light-hearted topic, so a football match, for example, you know, you don't need to send a journalist to tell you that you know Manchester United defeated Manchester City. You can you can find that immediately live, etc. And you know, uh, there are um, uh, you know platforms which will give you the information straight away. But you do need a journalist on the ground to go into the locker room with access, which a robot cannot do. Uh, through personal relations, get an exclusive interview with the manager or with one of uh, of the players. This is where the human touch matters, and, and a very simple uh, example. Um, where, where, where artificial intelligence can also help, for example, if, you've, uh, if you remember the horrific uh, uh, terrorist attack in Christchurch in New Zealand, uh, where a terrorist at, at entered the mosque and, and, and killed people. Um, where we can deploy, if we had the technology at the time, where we can deploy artificial intelligence is have facial recognition or uh, check who logged into the area so that we can find out who pro probably the victims were and we are able to contact their families. Uh, similarly, it would have helped, for example, the police department, instead of sending uh, 15 officers to invest or investigators to invent, they could find out immediately who checked in into uh, into the region while, you know, the verdict or the uh, uh, actual interrogation happens by uh, a real officer. So this is where technology and, you know, traditional media uh, can uh, work uh, hand in hand. Um, John, perhaps you could talk a little bit about tech and AI specifically in the online marketplace arena and how that's going to be impacting on the future of work, on jobs, and so on. Well, in, in, the, in general, I think there is, there is almost like an over-belief on AI and machine learning, and uh, it, it's a very kind of buzzy word to use. And uh, yes, it's true that you can very quickly sift through a lot of data, um, and often yeah, it's really changed the, quali the quality of um, uh, things in Silicon Valley. I think computer science is becoming very kind of generic in terms of uh, the type of work that you do when you're in computer science. And people who are more deeper on machine learning, it's more of an art than it is in science almost. And it's, it's, you, you, you train these kind of sponges. They're like blank sponges. You throw, them, you throw a lot of data through them. It creates these pathways. And then you, know, you clean the sponge out. And now you have this kind of hidden block of neural pathways that you can then get in and out information from in ways that just were not possible and it's it's yes so it is true it, it exists at the same time it's not at all happening at the speed that we expected uh, at facebook there's a team called applied machine learning and all they do is that they try to deploy uh, they try to create machine learning um, tools for other teams at facebook to use and they often have a hard time convincing the teams to, to use this technology because it's, it's not obvious yet what it actually can do that is of value for those teams who are running a business day to day. So it's a bit of a red herring, but I'm not saying it's completely a red herring, but it's a bit of a red herring. And, and we're further away from it having full impact. These algorithms that we're talking about um, in terms of which um, posts on the newsfeed of Facebook have been gaining the most traction, it's borderline not AI, really. It's 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 more uh, it's it's more just optimization algorithms, and uh, and I th so I think an overbelief in AI I think is a little too early, in my opinion. 
Um, it's that time in the session when we open out for question and answers. Hello, uh, I'm from uh, uh, Disruption Consulting, and uh, the the biggest event that changed the, our habit to consume the news was the Fukushima. And at that time, we were so lost, and we just stopped trusting all the, the traditional media. So, and and at the same time, I found the difference in the quality of journalism. The journalist, by reading the articles from the foreign media, like the uh, New York Times. So, uh, anybody, uh, can you uh, tell me how we, as a consumer, can support that? The movement of increasing the improving the quality of the the journalist, journalist and journalism. Hi, uh, my name is Kotaro Yamagishi uh, from KO Innovation Initiative. Uh, I have a question for John. Uh, as former executive of Google and Facebook, uh, my question is: uh, What and when you and your friends in Cinco Valley think uh, think you should allow your children? to access social media uh, because I have two boys, 11 and 7, and I allow them to access YouTube with child's filter, uh, and they often find uh, fake news from YouTube and told me. And so um, will Mark Zuckerberg allow their children to access Facebook when they become uh, 13? Uh, I want to know the latest trend in Silicon Valley. Okay, okay. So, so as I said, I, I think we should create some new institution to support public interest information. So, um, first of all, maybe in that sense, government intervention is necessary. And also crowdfunding, crowdfunding, but it doesn't work well still. So, some people, some, let's say, billionaire, also, li like Yamagishi-san, <laughs> Yamagishi-san or some uh, maybe millionaire, can maybe contribute some of their money to high quality journalism. R rather than buying art and airplanes. <laughs> and, yeah. and also, maybe the, the Guardian is a good business model. The Guardian is uh, now collecting contribution from individuals. And has that been working? I'm not following it. I, I know that they keep it free, and that whenever I look at the Guardian article, mm -hmm. they always ask for donations. Yeah, yeah. But and the number, number of regular contributors uh, has already exceeded uh, 600 million, uh, no, sorry, 600,000 every year. So that, that is a big uh, revenue for the Guardian. So we can imitate that kind of model maybe in Japan. So. Well, I just want to say one thing with empathy uh, to, to, to this before I answer the next question, which is I, I, I was in the US when Fukushima or the whole disaster happened. And I, I grew, first of all, I grew up in Sweden during uh, the Soviet era when uh, Chernobyl happened and we couldn't eat mushrooms or blueberries for two years. Um, so I, I, when they started talking about uh, Becquerel's, I was like, yeah, that rings you know, to something I recognized from my childhood. The CNN coverage was absolutely horrible, as in very, um, they were acting as if they were watching a movie when they were talking about the pictures and uh, Yuru Sanai. I feel like that's just a sign of how people feel distant with people who are in a different country and that was just unacceptable. So uh, yeah, CNN, like big minus points in my book. Um, and I can talk about BBC separately, but um, uh, yeah. But anyways, back to your point. So, um, well, I, I, have, uh, I have children and um, I don't want them to post any pictures of themselves online. Um, they can post stuff if they, if they, you know, if they want to be on Instagram and post, you know, the bagel they had for breakfast or the cinnamon roll they ate. That's fine. Um, but I've uh, I've never posted any pictures of my kids online either because that's that's my family. And after they're 18 or 20, sure they can go and do that if that's something you want to do. In terms of them accessing content. Um, I believe it's more harmful to keep them away from the reality of the world. Obviously, I don't want them to watch really, really scary stuff, and they will actively avoid that on their own, you know. But in terms of, I was just getting a new phone line for my son, and they asked if we, at the Dokomo store, obviously, Dokomo, I used to work there, um, 
and they ask, do you want to filter? And he's 14, do you, do you want to filter and install that the government you know, mandates to be available? And I said, absolutely not. You know, it's, I, I actually think that it's better that he builds up his own um, immune system a little uh, to see, see what's out there. And he grew up with YouTube. Uh, and YouTube has, told, has taught him how to play bass, how to solve the Rubik's Cube in under a minute. Uh, you know, his English is better for it. And I think as part of the YouTube generation, I think he's way ahead of, of where, where I was able to be because I had to go to the library and you know, find the books about baseball and uh, whatever it was I was interested in. And, and uh, so I think YouTube has been fantastic. Yes, there are these like really weird videos that you know, we need to avoid. I ask him about it. So what do you do when, you, when something comes up and an influencer starts you know, cursing a lot or does something? And he's like, yeah, I don't like that. So I just move on to something else. Uh, that might be different from depending on the personality of the kids, but in Silicon Valley as a, as a whole, uh, I think uh, parents debate when should our kid have a smartphone or access to a tablet. The consensus is that a lot of um, tech executive parents don't want to give iPads to their kids when they're very young. So they try to avoid the first couple of years. They don't want them to have, be too exposed to screens. But once they're like 12, 13, 14, they all have smartphones. They all have access to all the content. Uh, but me most of them have rules in place that they tell their kids they cannot put, uh, um, put pictures of themselves uh, online, uh, which I think is, is, a good, is a good rule. Uh, we'll take a few more questions, but I have a quick question myself about the Fukushima incident and how that was covered by journalists in Japan. Um, I can imagine the traditional media taking a very, you know, government stance, whatever they were told to report, they reported. But did you also have a contradictory narrative because of the fact that anybody out there could uh, be telling what the real situation is with a cell phone, with a Twitter account, with a blog? Did you also get that diversity of voices because of um, the fact that you had um, a digital transformation going on. Saki-san, perhaps uh, you could, and then if you'd like, you could also make a quick comment. I'm sorry, I'm not so familiar with that issue. Maybe the other person. Hmm, maybe you were too maybe. young at the too time. Too young. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, okay. Okay, perhaps we could take that later. We, could, we can discuss that later. Yeah. Let's open it up. We do have questions here. Yeah. We have three more questions. One, two, three. Can we take these? Hello, my name is Mohit. I'm from Globus. Uh, so, lately a lot of media houses uh, give up news based on ideologies and a lot of uh, viewers associated themselves with the media houses based on their ideologies and it goes on and on. So, how do we reduce the strife and make it more neutral so that uh, viewers are also interested in viewing the content of media houses which uh, propagate uh, maybe the other side of the story? Hi, I'm Jeremy Nadi. I'm a professor here at Globus, and I teach critical thinking. Obviously, something that we need more of in uh, this era of media. But just was wondering, what can media, whether uh, traditional or digital, do for themselves, yourselves, to help make people <coughs> more critical thinkers to avoid these biases? What can you guys do to help that as well? So my name is Kesuke Sonne. It's uh, in relating to for my question. So actually, I have two kids. Is uh, fortunately, unfortunately, already I allowed to use to uh, the YouTube. So actually, the, my the kids, the seven years, already the using the YouTube is uh, over the TV. So I think YouTube is amazing actually. So already uh, the same same thing that happened to the, you know the journalists. So you know, like the YouTuber, like in the free journalists, in the more you know the. Influencing over the TV casting or right in the traditional media. So how, how do you how do you think about that? Um, perhaps, Vezel, you could kick off, answer any... I'll, I'll uh, try to combine uh, how can we help with, with critical thinking. And, you know, sometimes I'm just astonished. So you have websites. Forget the malicious agenda. Forget the click farms. Forget uh, people, governments who uh, entertain this uh, sort of uh, operation. There are people who just do it for fun. So The Onion, for example. We have, uh, in the Middle East, we have a website called Pan Arabia Inquirer, which the tagline says, the Middle East uh, only seven star satire website right and you cannot get it more obvious that this is fake news done for fun yet you'll be surprised at how many people believe it and share it and you know I'm talking about ridiculous stories such as you know Emirates Airlines flying uh, flight from terminal one to terminal two for 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 passengers or serving shisha on and you know you have reputable journalists serving shisha on planes 
uh, uh, carrying it. So uh, I, I would rather hear your point of view as, you know, how could you teach people critical thinking? Because this is, this is ridiculous. There's nothing we can do. This is nothing we can do about it. Uh, and, 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 and to your, to the other question, um, I think um, we'll put the little money that we have where our mouth is. Uh, we're launching Arab News Japan uh, in October in Japanese because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about my part of the world in, in Japan. And there's a lot of misconceptions about Japan uh, in, in, in the Arab world and, and, and um, vice versa. So uh, we're coinciding it with the enthronement ceremony uh, of, of uh, the emperor on the 22nd of October, which hasn't been really broadcast before to, uh, to the region. And there's a lot of excitement already because you know we have a lot of monarchies uh, in, in our uh, region as well. And we hope this will be a very small contribution to creating a better understanding uh, between the two cultures. So would you like to address any okay. other questions? Uh, if you register Newspeaks, you can make comments on any news of Newspeaks. So I, I think the commenting on the news is the best way to enhance your critical thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have time for one more round of questions. Quick, please, to the point. Um, over there, over there, and over there. Hello, my name is Ted Wakamasu from uh, General Motors. Uh, my question is, uh, do you read newspaper and magazines, and if so, when and why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, um, next one. Hi, uh, this is Kei Sugawara. Uh, we are running a beauty media in Japan, and uh, about 10% of our traffic is coming from mainland China. It's because there are the, the many of the consumers are uh, kind of manipulated. Uh, is there anything we can do from outside China for the Chinese audience? And the third question? Uh, who else had a question back there? Oh, you. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm a growth marketing consultant. Uh, uh, back in the days, there was a infamous case of, uh, of course, Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, which was actually a huge scandal. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, governments are not actually capable to regulate it. Uh, is Silicon Valley doing enough? Uh, and what are they doing actually to work on this? Okay, so we have two minutes and... 12 seconds to answer that, so go. Faisal, you go first, second, third. I'll, Let's take, go. Uh, I'll take the questions on do I read newspapers and magazines, and uh, the question is uh, yes, absolutely, not just because I'm an advocate of print, but uh, it's very important for me not to be interrupted while I'm reading, especially if it's something important. The problem with phones is you keep getting WhatsApp messages, alerts, phone calls while, while you're trying to focus, and it's not very friendly if you're reading a, a long piece. So what I do is I keep the kind of breaking news, small updates uh, on the phone, but uh, even if I'm printing, uh, even if I'm seeing an article from a website, I, I usually print it and read it in, in print. It's better for my eyes. Uh, it's, uh, it's highly recommended. Um, and uh, the other thing is, uh, and I know I'm sort of in the uh, boring margin where people do, who don't have a life, but I like to read. <laughs> I like to read different perspectives on a certain uh, uh, topic. So you know, you, you see the two conflicting points of views. The truth is usually somewhere in the middle. John? Uh, so I'll answer the China question. Just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Send balloons, yeah, um, <laughs> you know, with little tags of truth. Um, no, I, I uh, well, I'd say no. You know, no one is doing enough. But but I, I'd say um, Google has always been quite truthful about the trade-off of using their services. Share your location in turn will give you this value. So in terms of the product design, the philosophy had always been when I, while I was there at least. Uh, if there's a creepiness factor, as in we're, we have to ask for some information, it always has to be paired with delivering a very tangible value, and then the person can make a choice whether they want to participate. So I think um, ver the transparency and the trade-offs of the information that you're making available to the platform and the expected value and how that can be used is really important. And, and I think that's where, where Facebook needs to um, really come to terms with not just going around saying that, oh, we're connecting the world and making the world better, but let's be honest about the fact that there has been a plan to try to maximize people's time spent on the platform, and ads are being say, uh, you know, sold matched against who we think you are in terms of your profile. And so I think, um, I think increased pressure on transparency of what those trade-offs are is not necessarily bad. 
uh, and that's 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 what I think the world can do, as opposed to having very surgical, uh, you know, uh, laws and, and regulations being put on. I've just been informed we have zero minutes left, but I think that Sasaki san deserves the last okay. one. So please. Uh, thank yeah. you. Uh, I don't read print newspapers, and I expect that the print newspaper will disappear maybe within the next few decades. But I, <laughs> but, but 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 I think that the print book, print book, will survive. Yeah, that's why news speaks. Ah, both, 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 both. That, that, that's, that's why news speaks have launched a new publishing company. Ooh, okay. And I will publish my book next month. So please buy it. <laughs> please buy it. Big hand for a wonderful panel and a wonderful audience. Thank you.